today's uh, webinar. I'm delighted that everyone can uh, join us. We've got a very good uh, number of attendees uh, today. This is the first in our autumn series of webinars, uh, Six Ways to Improve Quality Monitoring and Performance Management. Uh, I'd just like to introduce our speakers to you. Delighted that we're joined by uh, Martin Hill Wilson from uh, Brain Food uh, Extra. As you know, Martin won our best respected poll a couple of years ago. Uh, we're uh, doing that uh, uh, poll again currently, so it'll be interesting to see where, where Martin comes on that. And Martin will be uh, talking through six ways to improve quality monitoring and performance management. Uh, we've also got uh, Larry uh, Skowronek uh, from Nexidia in the United States. We'll be talking through uh, multi-channel performance management, uh, and he'll be giving us uh, some uh, observations uh, and uh, uh, some facilities within the next city of product that can help that. Uh, we'll be doing top tips from the audience. You'll also uh, will also be joined by Ed Creasy from Nexidia in the UK. He'll be joining us through the panel, and uh, we'll also be de dealing with live questions uh, from the audience. So before we get into it, just want to run a couple of uh, polls with the audience. Uh, the first poll that I'd like to uh, bring up is how many calls do you monitor for quality purposes per agent per month? I'm going to close the uh, voting. I'm going to share the results with everyone up on the uh, screen. And um, looks like the, the most common uh, answer we've got here is, uh, two to th is four to six people. That's about 41%. Uh, there is a, a sort of good number who are doing seven to 10 or 11 plus. Now, that's what you probably would normally do. Now, what I'd also like to do is explore what happens when it gets really busy in the contact center. So how many calls do you really answer when things start to uh, get busy? And uh, just going to share the uh, results up on the, up on the, up on the screen now. So it looks like four to six is still probably the most widespread. I think we see uh, less people in the in the 10 plus, and uh, it's sort of about 24% there, sort of naught, naught to one. So, Larry, I mean, you're, you're so f familiar with this. Would you, would you say that's sort of broadly in, in line with what, what you expected? Yes, I, I would think it is, uh, although I would have expected that the four to six group would have dropped off a little bit more than, than, uh, than it did, but it, that's a really good sign that even when things get busy, uh, contact centers are uh, staying focused on quality. Indeed. So um, we're now on to the uh, next part of the uh, agenda. I'm just going to hand the uh, baton now across to uh, Martin Hill Wilson. And uh, um, Martin's going to take us through a presentation of six ways to improve quality monitoring and performance management. Martin, if you'd like to uh, take us through your slides. Be delighted. OK. Good afternoon, everybody. Very good to be here. Um, I've got about 20 minutes, I think, just to talk through uh, some key ideas uh, in terms of advancing your agenda. Now, I know this is a topic that a lot of us know a tremendous amount to begin with. So the orientation of what I'm going to take you through here is to really look to how you'd like to be developing this in your next generation of it. And I want to raise some of the foundation issues that I think most of us feel we've got to begin with and suggest a way forward. Um, so. On that basis, let's just step back to what the heck we're doing in the first instance. I mean, really what we're looking to do is, is, is understand how we can get better at getting the most out of the people that we employ. You know, it's 70% plus of our operating budget. Uh, that's a tremendously significant amount of uh, proportion that we're spending there for on the people. Um, looking at the uh, latest statistics coming out from Steve Morell over at Contact Babel, for example, we've just gone back over 20% in the UK in terms of attrition. Uh, he reckons that's probably going to go back up to about 25%. So on average, you know, uh, a fifth of the workforce is coming and going as well, which never makes uh, consistency easy. And we have always got this underlying problem of there is the best group and there is the worst group. That might be just be in the single site or it might be spread across sites, but the reality remains and the prize of this whole thing is to say, can we reduce the delta between the very best and the very worst? Can we really identify 
what works as far as that best group is concerned, uh, and therefore get a more uniform level of, of production uh, out of people. And the impact, of course, that that has on our customer experience is, again, equally crucial uh, in today's space. So that's the overall context of what we're looking at. And the first idea I'd like to just put out, which is a very self-evident one, but is worth reflecting upon, is the ability to improve anything in life is a function of how good uh, our ability is to measure that thing. So I'm just going to run you through a, a short little sequence, which hopefully resonates with most of us, about how good our ability to measure in today's world is as far as performance and quality management is concerned. Now, first thing is, it's a manual process. It's an expensive process. We know that. Uh, and that results in the fact that we actually have relatively low sample sizes uh, as a result of that. What does that mean? Well, that means, you know, just as a matter of statistics, stuff that changes as far as um, our advisors are concerned, we're more than likely to miss some of those simply because we're not doing enough sampling. And put very simply, if we don't know it's taking place, we're not able to actually affect it. So as an ongoing consequence of this, there must be a number of situations that we remain unaware of. And in fact, Larry's going to talk us through an example later on of a classic example of that. Uh, in an American organization. The other thing that comes with a low sample size is that none of us, management, uh, advisors, team leaders, all of us, we're not quite sure how credible the insights are that get generated from this particular approach. Now, as far as the uh, advisor community is concerned, it's, it's a fairly common situation that we have to convince them of the fairness of this approach. If we are simply sampling four calls out of however many they actually do do uh, over the course of the month, uh, and, and often you get the repost that comes back and says, look, that just wasn't, that was not me. That wasn't uh, typical of the way that I've been working. Therefore, I don't think you should be evaluating me in that particular way. And that therefore leads to a very non-specific kind of coaching. I'm going to pick the point up again on coaching that actually the secret of coaching is in the detail of things. So where does that leave? It leaves the fact that actually trying to cause behavioral change, we're not as good as we might be as a result of it because of that whole chain and sequence of events. The other thing that actually uh, happens as a result of not really understanding the detail of things is the way that we do scoring, the categories that we have, uh, tend to be rather broad and tend to be rather unspecific. Uh, being polite, for example, showing empathy, for example, very difficult to understand and that leads to the whole business that we have going on in terms of the need for continuous calibration uh, and evaluation of whether or not we're, and we're evaluating something in a consistent way. That again drives into the fact that we feel it's unfair, but it leads to weak proof points in terms of what needs to change, which again leads into a cycle of low behavioral impact. So that's a sort of a simple way to describe some of the challenges that we've got going in our current environment. Uh, and I'd just like to ask everybody the extent to which that actually is true in your own circumstance. So, Jonty, I wonder if you could run us this poll now and just see what the, uh, the audience's experience of that cycle is for us. Hi everyone, we um, don't seem to have John T on the line at the moment, or he's muted himself. So uh, I'm just going to ask, oh there, are you uh, back? I'm here, yeah I'm back. Yeah, so uh, if you could vote on there, that now. Just while you're doing that, we've had an interesting comment in from Simon uh, in response to the question about um, busy periods. And what Simon says is we forecast staffing to include one member of the team constantly off the phone for coaching. So performance management is not affected by uh, uh, by busy periods. Which I think That's smart. Is, uh, is pretty smart there. So just close the results and uh, share those with you up on the uh, screen now. Uh, what restricts people? Uh, overwhelmingly, there 56% uh, of people say uh, not enough time to do coaching, uh, and uh, very similar, I suppose, time to find uh, suitable calls is the is a thing, um, and, and a pretty good spread on the uh, on the other ones there. Martin, back to you. Yes, I'd say exactly as expected, in fact, uh, the way in which all of that gets associated together. Great, thank you for that. So, let's move on. Um, so, what I want to 
really describe to you in terms of the next generation of this is, is, is starting to use analytics. Um, analytics uh, can be used actually for a whole bunch of things and as you can see on the slide here, um, it can be used for voice of the customer, um, it can be used for failure demand, that's pretty popular, but the bit that I'm talking about today is this, uh, is, is this section on performance management. So I just want to orientate us in terms of what we're talking about there. Now, coming back to a point that I made earlier on, effective coaching is all about uh, focusing on the detail of micro behavior. Martin, now, do you think I'd you could like be to give an put your slides up on the screen, please? Sure, can't you see that? Yep. Not oh, currently. Sorry. Right, my apologies. Um, show my, let's have a look. Is that coming through? That is now, yeah. Okay, great. Let me go back then very quickly. So what the section that I'm talking about today is performance management uh, within the use of analytics. And the key idea in terms of our next tip is focusing upon micro behavior. Now something that is quite recent for us to give a good example of this is we did very well in a number of areas as far as the Olympics are concerned and, and in particular a form of racing. Uh, that took place and, and, and somebody came to the surface in the middle of all that was a guy called David Braithford and he has done some really interesting work with his team there uh, and if you can just put your eyes onto that quote I won't read it out but the whole essence of his success has been his ability to spot things that are really very very detailed I mean I think he even gets concerned about the amount of sweat that is generated and held within the the costume of the of the cyclist and how does that impact their aerodynamic uh, capabilities and all the rest of that. Now, I think that's more extreme than we need to get into as far as the call center is concerned, but the principle here is absolutely on, on, on the money, which is the more that we understand about the detail of behavior, the more able we are to actually help people change their own behavior, i.e. effective coaching is a function of that. So let me give you a number of areas where I think that this could apply uh, as far as call center is concerned. Um, certainly everything that we need to do uh, a round of compliance and, and, and script, the better we understand the way in which people are or are not using that, again, the more effective we can be. Attrition, whether or not we're talking about new hires. Now, again, most people will have modeled the fact that there are key points at which people come or they go as far as employment is concerned. And generally speaking, the first day out on the phones is terrifying, and then I think the next 12 days, I'm not sure about that, but a very short period of time, uh, people you know, either stay or they don't get over that hurdle. And that's the point where you really need a terrific amount of mentoring, hand-holding, and detailed feedback to help people get through. That's a high yield area. Same too with customers, by the way, uh, if we can understand all the, uh, all the symptoms of when customers are giving us clues around of when they're likely to disappear. Sales conversion. Let me give you an example around of this. You've got two groups of people, possibly both of them are doing fairly well uh, in terms of conversion, and yet one group is twice as productive in terms of signed opportunities than another. You've got to really get into the detail to understand what's happening there. Let's say, for example, it's as simple as the difference between the use of open versus closed questioning technique. Um, now, you really need to be able to study things to be able to understand the difference between those two things. Once you've got it and you understand it, it's a piece of best practice that you can pass across to the other team and therefore you can start to see things improve. Same approach happens as far as what are this group doing that causes those customers that they interact with to generally speaking leave a high NPS score as a post-call survey. Why is that happening? What are they doing? Can we get other people to understand that? And then there's a, just a, a general principle which is that we're always chasing this kind of opportunity which is how can we get the same result in 50% less average handle time. If one group's doing it well, another group's taking twice as long, why is that and what can we do to spread that best practice? So if we think about that, um, how are we going to achieve that? Because the survey told us actually the trouble we've got is the time it's taking us to find these opportunities for getting into the detail and then that impacts on the time that we've got available for us to coach. So analytics allows us to fundamentally reorganize the way that we use our resources in a much more intelligent way and it's contained in those tips. What we can now do is automate the process of searching both for risk compliance management and also for opportunity to improve things. 
What we then do is we use the people side of what we're doing in terms of finding the relevant stuff and making much more powerful interventions as a result of that. So if you step back from that, the tip that I'm putting out here is to say actually what we're really looking at here is a complete reinvention uh, of the way that we utilize people. And that's actually what this survey is all about. It's stepping back and saying, what are we really looking at in terms of appraising this in the future? So let me give you a, a, a little model, if you want, to think about the way in which you could be working. Let's so assume you've got multi-channel, by the way. Larry is also going to talk about this in a while. You can use not just voice. You can talk about uh, text-based interactions. Could be email, could be chat, uh, could be SMS. In today's world, it could also be social channels as well. Um, what's your performance improvement workflow uh, that uh, you need to be de uh, developing? First idea is you automate the process of discovery. Again, I'm not going to spend time on that because Larry is going to give us examples how that's actually done. What you then want to do is, once you found an area of interest, is get into the detail so you can start to understand some of that micro behavior that I was talking about. You're then in a position where you can sit down with an advisor and say, listen, this is what's happening. This is the information. Let's really talk about this. Let's understand this in, in a supportive, collaborative kind of a way. And then we've got the ability, because we understand the detail of it, to actually output actions and an improvement list. All of which, by the way, then needs to be underpinned with two things. The ability to track that behavioral improvement at an individual or a team level, but that's a very powerful notion, at an individual level. And then, by the way, embed it. Now, one of the interesting points about behavior and changing behavior is, of course, that it's easier to stick with what we know about than try new stuff. And a lot of coaching fails to make a permanent impact because other things come up and we're not able to embed that. So part of this cycle has to recognize that we need to be able to provide both team leader and advisor with the ability to stay focused until that becomes a natural part of somebody's behavior. So that's my other point to you. Sustaining improvement begins with the ability to maintain attention, as I just showed. So let's uh, have our second poll and, uh, and ask the question, uh, which of those, from your point of view, do you reckon is most important? Okay, if you'd like to uh, vote now. So which uh, step matters to you most in the performance cycle? Is it discover? Is it uh, deep dive into detail? Is it uh, the debate, the discussion? Is it uh, action? Or is it about tracking and embedding it into, uh, uh, into your actions? So if you'd just like to uh, vote on that, uh, it is a single uh, single vote. So if you could vote on the uh, one that is uh, uh, most appropriate, if there is a an answer missing on there, if you just like to type that into the uh, into the question box, just going to close that off now and share the uh, results with everyone. Uh, uh -huh. By and uh, uh, big majority there for uh, track and uh, or most votes there for track and embed about forty percent, uh, followed by action. And uh, discovery, deep dive. That surprised me. Uh, only about nine nine percent on on uh, on deep dive there. So, is, Martin, was would you, was that what you were expecting? Uh, yes, actually, it certainly. Uh, I'm not so sure about the deep dive bit. Maybe Larry can explain that better. Maybe I haven't really passed the idea over uh, in a way that people can understand. But the bit about uh, not being able to track and embed, I'm delighted that that's been picked up because I'm, I'm, I'm clear that that is a major problem that we've got. So that's good. Let's just quickly, I've only really got one last outstanding idea now that I would like to go through. Is that visible, John T? It is way? indeed, yeah. Okay, great. So the other area, by the way, that really does matter is the ability then to make sure that the changes that we can see behaviorally are then reflected in all the associated support services that we have as part of our overall customer service ecosystem. So the top layer, generally speak, at uh, the top of the screen is to do with people that we can affect within uh, our customer service environment. QA team obviously need to be absolutely involved in that, team leaders, uh, customer service leadership. Also, by the way, if we're making breakthroughs in terms of behavioral change, that we've not been able to make before, that's going to surely feed back into our workforce management planning as well. Because it may well be actually our productivity suddenly makes a you know an absolute step change which should then be reflected back into our planning. So the point about closed loop is 
have we made sure that all of those people have got the, ne the, the right level of visibility and are brought into uh, the process of participating in a way that means we keep moving forward in a coordinated way. The second bottom part of the screen talks to the fact that actually also this impacts other areas. Training obviously it impacts because it suddenly allows us to be much more forensic and detailed about the kind of training that we want to put back into possibly the induction program or, or standard modules. HR, it may teach us some stuff in terms of uh, how we recruit, for example, and how they can support people better there. Uh, legal, it may also, well, it will change the way in which we do compliance management. And the mere fact that we can automate and we can actually do that in a much more comprehensive way leads to a very interesting discussion with those who own that issue uh, in a functional sense. And then voice of the customer. Although this is primarily focused at the moment on us discussing performance as far as advisors are concerned, it will inevitably throw up issues and opportunities as far as the end customer is concerned, and therefore we should be feeding that back into whatever team owns that within the organization. So therefore, final idea is this. Ongoing improvement is facilitated by closed loop management. And I think that takes me to the end of my section, John T. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Martin. I think there's some uh, uh, very good uh, food for thought uh, in there. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we are looking for top tips for quality monitoring uh, and performance management. Uh, so if you'd like to add in your tips, we've had about three or four so far. So uh, if you add in a tip, there's probably quite a good chance uh, if it comes up top, you'd win that bottle of champagne. Uh, I'm now delighted to hand across to uh, Larry Skowronek from uh, Nexidian. Uh, Larry is uh, going to talk about multi-channel performance management. So I'll just pass the baton across to uh, Larry. And uh, Larry, if you'd like to uh, put your slides up on the screen and uh, take us through your um, take us through your presentation, will be great. Uh, Larry, across to you. We're seeing an agenda. We are. Thank you, John. Yeah. Can you? All right, great. Thank you. So what, uh, what I'd like to do is follow on on some of the themes and get a little bit more specific, some of the themes that, that Martin introduced. We've kind of covered the, the first couple or several bullet points here, and I'm going to go through uh, a little bit more detail and expand on those thoughts. Uh, the, the first thing that we have to reiterate is the, the fact that the traditional performance management quality management process has always relied on, you know, you need to, to have that process be based on what's actually going on with individual customers and with uh, the agent's behavior. And the only way to do that is to get into the individual interaction, interactions. And so uh, traditionally, as, we, as uh, everybody noted in the, in the poll, it's, been, it's a very expensive process to go about finding calls that give examples of behavior. And a lot of coaching programs rely on simply taking a random uh, sample, a very small sample, out of the overall interaction population and using those random, randomly sampled calls as the way to uh, find performance issues and measure performance. And we, we know that, that, as Martin talked about, that the biggest issue with that is that the samples are just plain too small. And the probability that you're going to find important issues is very, very small. But even more importantly, if you do happen to find an important issue in one of those five calls or ten calls and you're able to coach on it, the probability you'll find that sort of behavior the next time you come around to that agent to coach them, say in the next month, to, to, to know whether or not the coaching took effect, that the probability of that is next to zero. So this is why the traditional quality monitoring programs have trouble uh, this is one of the reasons why they have trouble um, make creating change and sustaining it. So what you need is an approach that relies on processing and analyzing every single phone call, all of the, the calls, all of the interactions, so that um, the laws of statistics and mathematics don't prevent you from finding those issues that are the most important. So that really means you need to use interaction analytics as part of your performance management program. And what interaction analytics is, a, is about doing is understanding how your agents are interacting with customers, how are they performing against your key initiatives, uh, not generic, fuzzy, 
fuzzy measures of politeness and so forth, but key initiatives. Um, what best practices can you uh, glean from the top performing agents and then spread across your entire agent population, et cetera? And the, the, the point here is, is that you're doing this work in order to make the, your coaching programs uh, extremely meaningful, to have a meaningful effect on agent performance. Uh, in some cases, maintain, monitoring and maintaining compliance is a, a critical thing that you need to do. But it's really about servicing what's most important. And what's most important um, at any given point in time may actually change. And so flexibility in a quality management program and a performance management program is a, a key factor that you have to be able to, to, uh, to surface and support. Now, as Martin touched on, um, you know, we all know that obviously the, the classic interaction management problem, the classic contact center medium is the voice, is phone calls. But more and more, uh, customers want to contact us by a, other channels, such as chat and email are common. And, and also, social media is becoming more and more important as a, a, a means, not just as a, a way to, to measure customer sentiment or market sentiment about our products and brands, but more and more social media is becoming an actual medium for a customer to contact our businesses. And so we can't, we can't focus only on the call center. We've got to focus on the contact center, and we've got to think broadly across all the different ways that the customer wants to work with us. And that needs to apply to the performance management methodologies. Right? So we need to be thinking about our agent's performance and the quality of their interactions uh, in terms of not just how they handle phone calls, but how do they, how do they write in their chats, how do they write in their emails, um, do they have a presence in, in social media, and so forth, so that um, just like you know, we, we need to evolve the quality monitoring program around the call center from a randomly selected five, it's not enough to, to randomly select a small sample out of all those interactions. Uh, we need to get all of the phone calls. Uh, we also can't stay focused on the phone. We've got to be thinking broadly about all of the, and pulling all of the interactions together. Um, performance is not about how did you do on the phone, on a phone call, versus how did you do on a chat. Performance is about how did you handle the customer? How did you service the customer? Did you did you handle the customer's issue? Now, but that's, there, there's a, another dimension to this that, that we need to not forget, and I think that in a, in a lot of cases, this proves to be one of a, it, it's sort of an, an older problem, and yet um, this, we have an opportunity here to really solve this, this older problem, that is the, the issue of performance management when some of our interactions are handled by an outsourced partner. And, and you know, we, we, you, you see in a lot of cases where uh, some of those phone calls or some of those chats or some of the emails are handled by an outsourced partner. That partner may have resources in another country. That partner may have their own infrastructure and so forth. And in a lot of ways, what happens at, at that partner's location is a black box to us. And it doesn't need to be that way. So, you know, we, we see over and over again contact centers trying to structure various different uh, metric programs and reporting programs to try and and measure and monitor and measure how the, the outsourced partner is performing. But when it comes to quality, it's, a, it's, it's virtually impossible to do that kind, of a, that kind of a thing. So the key here is to, when you're thinking about performance management and quality management across all of your contacts, don't forget your outsourcers. And an, an interaction analytics program, the, the solution is not uh, the very complicated reporting and metric programs that you negotiate with the partner. The solution is simply a partner, give me the interactions, and I'm going to analyze them uh, along with all of the calls and emails and chats that I handle internally. Uh, they're, my, they're my customers. They're my customer interactions. I'm going to, to handle them in the same way that I handle the, um, 
all of my internal interactions. And so, you know, the, the message here is that consistent quality monitoring, consistent quality measurement, consistent performance management requires that you, number one, you work with all of the interactions, and that's the, the primary point, you work with all of the interactions, and that you include your chats and your emails, and that you include all of the interactions that are handled by your outsource partners, that they all come back together into the interaction analytics uh, platform so that your performance management can work with all of your, your customer interactions and all of the, the agent behavior. So one of the, let's, let's talk now about how you might actually, what this would look like or could look like in, in real life. Um, the, the, the poll that Martin ran a, a little bit earlier talked about, um, many of you said that the embedding and tracking uh, part of the life cycle is the, the one that's most important to you. And I, I think that's a, that's a really good point because, you know, as you know, you can't, you can't manage what you can't measure. And what we're really talking about is what, what can you do with interaction analytics across all of your channels and all of your calls and, and emails and chats and so forth? What can you do with this capability to ensure that you're, you're measuring and monitoring the, the correct things in your performance management program to drive the results you need to drive. And so let, let's talk a little bit about that. Really what, what we're saying here is that it all comes down to the key performance indicators and metrics that you're going to use to manage, that you use to manage the business. Now those, those key performance indicators and metrics will vary. Um, and so what I have here is an example of a, of a, of a dashboard that is designed for a communication company, you know, somebody that maybe um, they, they offer a phone and internet service or maybe it's mobile phone service or um, that kind of a thing, cable TV, that kind of communications company. And, and for these, these kinds of companies in this industry, uh, measuring and, and managing the, what it costs to service the customers uh, how are we doing at retaining our customers? Because in that industry, retaining customers, it's much more expensive to get a new customer than it is to retain an existing customer. It's very important to do that. What's the, the revenue that we generate per subscriber is an extremely important measure. And then how are we uh, in managing our risk and ensuring that we're staying in compliance with all of the various rules and regulations and, and laws as we do business in lots of different localities is extremely important. So. Tracking and embedding, and and so, so one of the things about the, the life cycle Martin talked about is that that you you're you're constantly going in around that loop. So we here we have measures and key performance indicators that we're tracking, but those those key performance performance indicators enable us to discover new issues. And here we have an example of a new issue where the average handle time overall in our cost to serve component is dropping. And typically that's a good thing. And then we, we do a little bit of detailed analysis and we notice that, well, wait a minute, it's actually only one of our major locations, our outsource partner in Cambridge, where the average handle time is dropping. That's an interesting thing. Typically if average handle time dropping is, a, is something that you planned on and you're driving for, you would see that happen across all of the locations. Uh, that's not happening. So we, we take a look at one of the other, the next metrics, and that is the, the dispatch rate. Now, now for us, because uh, of the, our communications uh, industry example here, um, this communications company has a physical plant, and, and often, you know, when you're hooking up a phone line or hooking up internet service, you have to... A, a truck, a technician goes out to the location where the service is to be installed and needs to do some work. And so here we notice that the dispatch rate overall has been trending upward, and that's not a good thing, which is why we color it red. And we look in a little bit more detail, and we see that it's actually that same location, our outsource partner at Cambridge. So you could, you could imagine that, you know, we, we have a theory here that well, maybe the reason the average handle time is going down is that they're taking some kinds of shortcuts uh, for 
when they for when they decide to roll a truck. But let's let's test that theory. So now we need to go to the next level of the process. We need to deep dive. We need to 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 drill into what's going on in our contact center across all the locations, but especially at Cambridge, and see what's happening. And and so the first thing we do is we use the the interaction analytics to get a a, a sense for what types of of calls are coming into that location. And we see that we're getting 16% of the calls coming in are about customers saying that um, they're getting an error message on the television saying the channel will be available shortly. They're, some of them are saying they don't have a picture. Some of them, uh, a small percentage, 4% are having trouble uh, you know, buying movies on demand, that kind of a thing. So let's, let's, do, let's drill into a little bit more detail. So now we kind of get a, a, a nice understanding of the the distribution of the types of calls that are coming in to our support queue. Now let's drill into what's going on in the Cambridge location. And what we find that when a customer is calling about one of those, those error messages that we saw on the previous screen, we find that 16% of the time the agents in Cambridge are rolling a truck, they're dispatching a truck. But only 25 and 29% of the time are they taking care of the troubleshooting steps, such as sending a signal to the, to the piece of equipment at the customer's location, they're only doing those troubleshooting steps before they roll the truck 25 and 29% of the time. That's not very often. So we expect that number to be, those numbers to be much higher because our, our normal troubleshooting process says you're supposed to execute these two steps before you dispatch a truck. And um, so what we need to do now is, is dive into the, the next level of detail, which is Barry, we need to... Barry, we've got, we've, got, we've got about five minutes left of your presentations when we need to pick up some of these steps. Uh, understood. We, we need to get into the actual interactions themselves. We need to to hear and read exactly what the customers and the, the agents are saying. And when we do that, we find that indeed those agents are not, they are skipping the troubleshooting steps and they are going straight to rolling the truck. And you know, you can understand why that might be. We were measuring the agents on their overall average handle time. And we are probably paying the, the customer on, or the, the outsource partner on average handle, on keeping average handle time down. So what are they doing? They're skipping the troubleshooting steps because that's what we told them to measure. So what we need to do now is take action. Uh, we, we go into that outsource partner, we, we coach the outsource partner on, hey look, you've got to do the, the troubleshooting steps before you dispatch the truck and we're going to change the measures and we're now going to measure, we're going to, we've created a metric here the legitimate dispatch rate, and we're going to measure agent performance based upon the fact that they are performing the, the, the troubleshooting steps first. And what we see here, as we start to do that, we see a, an agent here, Charles Hayes. His, his score for the legitimate dispatch rate is, is below target. And we look at the, his, the trend of his performance within the, the period. So this was a measurement of the last 30 days. And indeed, he's been, his legitimate dispatch rate is gradually going downwards. So what we want to do is we want to focus on Charles Hayes. Charles Hayes is an outlier that needs coaching, right? Now, we also notice that there are other agents, such as Ana Lopez, who's doing really well, except that when we look at the trend over the last 30 days for Ana, we see that she's starting to, um, and her transfer rate, one of our measures is transfer, and her, we're seeing her transfer rate start, starting to climb. So she may be green now, but she's going to be headed to the red. So now what we need to do, those, now the supervisor knows which agent needs the focus. So we're going to go into, to focus on Charles Hayes, we're going to pull back all of Charles Hayes's calls where he dispatched a truck. We're going to, uh, so these are all, every single one of these is an example of the behavior where the truck rolled without the, the troubleshooting steps. We'll pick one of them to fill out uh, an evaluation form, you know, the traditional quality monitoring form. And we do this, we need to do this so that we have a record of what the, the coach observed. And this will 
serve as the, the document that we coach around. But when we get into the coaching session, we're not coaching on a single randomly selected call. We're coaching on all of the calls. And the one that was selected here is merely an example. And if the, the, the coach and the agent see that they need to do it, they can uh, go back and listen to every single one of those calls if they need, it, need to do. And so now the supervisors have a mechanism to find the agents that need attention and coach them so that the overall, that the business metrics at the highest level all get moving in the correct direction. So the, the, the coaching program is tied directly to the, our, our highest level business outcomes. Now one of the corollaries to this is that what's important to you will change and shift. As the, your business changes, as uh, the overall strategic ob objectives change, that's one of the drivers of what, what causes change in your, the, the metrics in your quality monitoring program. What you also uh, will realize is that as you improve performance, so we improve performance in uh, one area, we'll, we'll, we'll stop measuring that and, and focus on improving performance in, in the next area. So what the kinds of measures that we need to be focusing on, that we need to be driving behavior down all the way down to the individual frontline supervisors and agents does change over time. It, it can be it's specific to your industry, but even within your industry, one company to another may be different. And, uh, but even what anything you establish right now uh, will not remain constant over time. Your business will change. Your agents will improve their performance. The coaching, the coaches will improve their ability to, to coach, and and so forth. So, dynamic, um, a dynamic program is a key component of, of success here. So, as we think about moving forward, it, it's important to understand that in order to provide a consistent and global quality management program. Uh, you need to be working with all of the interactions, regardless of the channel, uh, and all of the interaction re interactions regardless of who handled it, both internal and, and external. Um, as, as Martin was uh, suggesting, uh, you may be in for redeveloping your entire approach to how you uh, handle uh, things like headcount requirements for team leaders and quality assurance coaches. Um, how you determine and state your performance goals and the fact that they are going, they, they will need to be changing and be flexible, and then reorienting your customer service teams um, and the, the support teams for customer service, such as HR and legal, to, to move forward with new goals and be flexible as those goals need to change. Because it's all about measuring what's most important and what's relevant. And, and as we've talked about, that is not going to be constant. All right, and so follow the performance improvement workflow, discover an issue, deep dive into it, listen to and read the actual interactions and debate what's happening there and, and come to conclusions where you can take action. And then take that part of the taking action is, is creating the right kinds of measurements and performance goals that you can then use to track and then embed in the, uh, your day-to-day, hour-to-hour management activities. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Larry. I think one of the um, most fascinating things I find is that, uh, you know, lots of people have been using um, analytics for helping their um, quality management, uh, uh, quality monitoring programs. Um, but I think it's also quite fascinating as, as more people use it, the overall pricing levels are starting to, to drop, which is making it much more much more affordable for everyone. Now it's uh, time in the audience to send in uh, your hints and tips. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, add those into the uh, the question box, uh, we've got quite a large number of um, uh, of ones that have come in through already. We'll endeavour to get through as many uh, as we can. I'm going to bring in uh, our speakers, Larry Skaronek, Martin Hill Wilson, and also joined by Ed Creasy as well to participate in the discussion now. Um, the first tip that we've been um, sent in is um, engage your team in coming up with the quality uh, with the quality monitoring. This means they understand it, buy into it, 
and uh, also prove it to the customers. Martin, I think that's quite a nice, uh, quite a nice tip there. The whole thing, brilliant. I, I mean, the more you can empower through involvement and co-creation, the more powerful it will be in terms of credibility, involvement, and willingness to change. So, a top tip there. Yeah, very good. Um, interesting one, Simon, Ed, I, I think this is sort of right up your street. We now measure and pay bonus against uh, year-to-date performance against annual targets. So performance daily, weekly, monthly performance char uh, changes are, are, are not missed. That's sort of quite a quite an interesting way of, of, of it sort of impacts your latest performance, but it's also, you know, averaged out as well. Yeah, I, I think um, we all know that you can make an impact with agents in a, in a very, very uh, granular way. And, and I think what, this, what the approach you've seen today gives you with quality is instead of the once a month dip check where you've got one or two calls to talk about, it, you know, and this just sort of extends from Simon's point here, it's saying, I want to make an impact with an agent today, I want to track it tomorrow, and then look at some new areas the day after that. And so that's what having the scale of calls give you, gives you is, is, to, is to make your, your measures and the measures you coach on far more dynamic. Yeah, and we've got one nice one from Rebecca here. It seems obvious, but we never tell the agent. We allow them to listen, reflect, and ask questions for them to draw out the idea development for, you, for themselves. And I guess, Larry, this is all about this sort of uh, feedback loop that you were, you were talking about, allowing, you know, providing the information to allow um, people to, to develop themselves. And I guess sampling size probably has a, has a big a point in there because it's actually about, about getting a reflective call if you're going to use this method rather than necessarily hammering people on, on the sort of non-compliant ones. Indeed. Um, one of the things that we've seen as, as, as people move their performance management, quality management to uh, this more 100% approach is that when you get into the, the coach and the agent go to that the coaching session and, and their meeting, uh, because you're dealing with all of the interactions that the, the agent doesn't have the ability to say, oh, well, that was, you happen to find the one case where I did that, but I never, I, I only did that once, right? So it changes the whole, the, the, the tenor of the whole conversation. It, it's possible to, it removes that, that ability to, to blame the sample size, basically, and allows the coach and the agent to become much more collaborative and look at all of the interactions and really see the patterns and reflect yeah. on those and, and try to deal with the pattern. Yeah, and I guess that's sort of very similar to, to Zoe saying here, a good tip is we get our colleagues to listen to their calls as individuals and within their team to share great customer service experience uh, and also not so great one. There's sort of an element of um, team review there. I have came across once a, a, a contact center where people got buddied up and uh, two people would buddy up and um, provide feedback to each other on their calls. Which I guess is I think, quite uh, I think John, so just a quick view on that. What we, the, the scorecard you saw there, and the, the, is a great example of a, a technique that, that a lot of our clients use. Is what they do is they will have um, a quality initiative in there that's where agents, for example, sent out a truck roll or didn't sell. So obviously, you want to look for those opportunities where you're not hitting your corporate objectives. But next to that, you can have a column where agents are selling. So it's a really quick way. So you're automatically finding these calls. You're coaching an agent on all the opportunities. But then straight away, you can say, but look at it when you did it. Uh, in, in a good example, so you've got best practice automatically put in front of you. And if the agent hasn't got any best practice because they're new, you can click into another team member and say, look, this is, this, this is how Martin does it over here. So it's kind of it's automating that element of, of buddying up. So it makes it a much more positive conversation. Yeah, and here's an interesting one from Donna. I guess this is sort of a little bit like deep dive, uh, Martin. Every every agent has one piece of work monitored per week, but if they get eighty percent, then we put in a second uh, a, a second call or piece of work. That's sort of quite an interesting way of you know sort of uh, sort of like a, a sort of a, 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 I guess that's a pass fail type of thing, is it? Well, I th I, I'm. I'm reading it slightly differently there. If less than 80%, then a second one is done. So I think probably this is all about exception management, which is, which is again, right. Uh, I think Larry talked about outliers. And, and, and certainly, having looked through some of the, the comments that Simon has been making, uh, again, he's, he mentioned that point, that really the most powerful way of getting a result is to concentrate on the people who most need it. 
So therefore, if your measurement ability allows you to focus upon either the worst performers, you focus on getting them up. The other side of that is that those people are very good. Again, you're trying to capture their best practice. Yeah, and here's one I've not uh, not heard of uh, before. My tip for call monitoring is to choose a theme for the month. I guess that the flavor of the month, it could be soft skill, pitch, tone, or empathy, or it could be technical, information provider system use. I've had some good results by getting the guys to focus on one point per month. Uh, you can read the, the other bits in there. I think that's, that's quite, quite innovative in terms of uh, in terms of the different approach. Let's uh, go down the list. We've got loads of uh, tips down here, so I want to make sure that uh, we cover people. Uh, Teresa, I'll often ask a new team to conduct a simple personality test. This educates them on their own and others' personality types. I guess that's very much about you know different types of personalities reflect you know get will deal with feedback on a different way. Some people, I guess, can be um, quite upfront about feedback. Others, others may not. Ed, Ed, have you have you come across that very much? Well, I, I think from 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 what we're doing, particularly if we're trying to find specific call types, it links together actually both the, the last Kieran point and this point, which is. What you want to do is do coaching on specific examples, and it's it, it's more impactful. Yes, you still want all the good coaching models where it's open and, a, and an agent can talk about you know the things they need help with. But there's nothing more powerful than you're looking at a specific example in a conversation. So that might be if, if you're talking about personality type, you might have a customer who's saying, "I want to speak to a manager." You can do a bunch of coaching on how you deal with that that month, and you can then have like a thematic approach to quality over the year. So month one, I'm going to nail complaints. Month two, I'm going to uh, nail transfers. Month three, I'm going to nail callbacks. So you can apply those principles to the way you do quality. Okay, and we've got uh, huge numbers of tips coming through. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write up all these tips, and uh, I think we're going to publish them in uh, next week's edition of uh, Call Center Help. There's some fa fantastic stuff. Uh, Lee has been giving the team the opportunity to listen and assess some of their own work. Uh, which is a, a sort of uh, a topic that's come across. Um, this person has said, uh, improve the agent uh, desktop. If you can simplify mm. the agent desktop, uh, then it uh, could be um, uh, could be a bit easier. I don't know if this is someone who sells agent desktops, but it's certainly a, a, a good uh, good suggestion. Uh, Gareth has said, learn what coaching method suits the individual agent. Some prefer a tell, some may prefer a grower. That's a sort of similar approach to uh, one we've uh, before lots actually let agents critique their own uh, their own calls um, Joe interesting one uh, this is the last tip we'll take for the for the minute uh, feedback after every call which gives the agent an opportunity to improve their score before the next call is monitored I guess that's going to be pretty uh, difficult unless you have some form of um, uh, you know scoring technology that can um, that can make that happen. So um, we know that there's a number of people who've got uh, questions. We're now going to go across to uh, questions and answers uh, from the audience. Uh, so we'll pick up a couple of questions. Uh, would having one of the agents you monitor completing call monitoring for one of the other teams on a regular basis with everyone getting their turn be beneficial? So let's see if I can... Uh, Martin, would you have a view on that one? I'm not quite sure what the question is here. Uh, yes, I, I would support anything that allows uh, the people who have been monitored to get more deeply involved to see both sides of the fence. So I think that is one of a number of themes. Rebecca's come up with an idea of that as well. And I'm absolutely supportive of trying to get people much more involved in it. So rather than being spoken at and being subjected to, uh, people feel a much greater sense of ownership. And that's a good technique to help facilitate that mindset. So yes, good idea. Okay, uh, James has said, I'm part of a four-person QA team, and in the near future it's being looked into that behaviors will be removed from our framework, as it's seen too open to interpretation. It was mentioned earlier in the presentation, we need to be more specific. However, do you have any suggestions on how you can incorporate this without having an extensive list of things agents may not have said or or done so it's about avoiding the uh, I guess avoiding the the lengthy checklist Ed have you got a, a view on that absolutely I actually think the opposite should happen 
you know, I, I think there are things that an automator can do that is about the checklist. You know, the black or white, did it happen or didn't, did it happen or did it not happen? Where you need more human subjective uh, ability is things around how you measure empathy, how you measure rapport. You know, and, and, and so actually I think what, what we need our QA people to do is we, we really need to empower them. Let's make it easy for them to, to get to calls. Let's remove all this checklist stuff they do uh, because we can automate that and let's leave them doing the really subjective, qualitative call listening and then coaching and action on the back of it. So actually I'd suggest the opposite because I think, you know, the difference between an extremely warm and an extremely cold call can't be uh, decided by a computer. No, I think that's uh, I think that's a very uh, a very good point. It's looking at the outcome rather than you know did you say uh, did you say say this and, and sort of that that uh, just just to add scoring. one extra thing for James on that that obviously if you can automate that it gets much easier. But if you are not in that position right now, the other way through it is to stay with having micro behaviours, but focus upon which are the ones that have the biggest payoff, so your list doesn't get too big. Mm. That's interesting. Larry, here's a, a question for you. Um, when we identify outliers of people who are not performing, do people think it's appropriate to lessen monitoring levels, i.e. the sample size of strong performers, and spend time instead on the underperformers? Or is it better to keep spending time equally on, on monitoring all stuff? I guess there's a, a technology angle to this as well. Yes, I think that in general it's, it's not usually productive to, to monitor every individual equally, focus on the outliers, and, and I think when we talk about outliers, we're talking about the, bot, the lower, the bottom performers and the top performers. You need to monitor the top performers frequently as well because that's where you get the insight about the, the best practices and the, the new behaviors that can really drive the results. And of course, by focusing on the bottom performers, that's how you move things. You move the, that's the quickest way to move the overall average. To, to get the results that you need. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm 